All right, cool. So the next speaker is a former colleague of mine, uh, Eugene, one of my favorite engineers ever. He was one of the first people that I know of that implemented the Kubernetes networking model. So if any of you have experience with the Kubernetes networking model, there's a tool called Flannel that came out that made it really easy to implement this model in a way that uh, most people find that most of the solutions we see today that integrate with Kubernetes provide. So it's really my pleasure to see him giving a talk on Kubernetes network interface, plugins for Kubernetes and beyond. So with that, let's give a big round of applause to Eugene from CoreOS. Um, my name is Eugene. I work at CoreOS, one of the software engineers there. And today I want to talk to you about uh, the networking in Kubernetes. So let's start off by uh, reviewing what the networking model is for Kubernetes. It's uh, very simple from the user standpoint of view. We give each, each part a unique IP, and all the machines in the cluster can talk to each other. Um, by this IP. I mean, all the pods in the cluster can talk to each other via this IP. So it makes it very simple. Uh, you don't need to, do, to worry about port mapping for the most part. Um, there is no NAT, there is no translation. It's just kind of like being on the, on the internet. Everything has its own IP. However, it's one thing to um, um, say that you're going to give each thing its own IP, and it's a different thing to actually make it a reality and give each part its own IP. So how do you actually do that? Uh, well, there's a couple of ways. If you're running on top of a cloud provider, such as AWS or GCE, uh, then Kubernetes already ships with these cloud provider plugins, kind of that these integrations that use the advanced routing capabilities of the cloud providers and uh, program their virtual, uh, virtual routers to satisfy the networking model that Kubernetes expects. If you are not running on top of the network, uh, on top of a cloud, then things are slightly more complicated. Obviously, your, uh, your hardware is, uh, your machine is running uh, in bare metal, it's going to get only one IP per, um, per host. But what we actually need to do is provide multiple or lots of IPs uh, to each host. So we end up, we have to virtualize the network. And there are lots of ways to virtualize the network. Um, I listed kind of a couple of buzzwords or you know, techniques that can be used. Stuff on the left is uh, more or less the, the low level bits that ship with the Linux kernel. Uh, things like the Linux bridge that Docker, for example, uses. The, that's the Docker Zero that you see. Uh, Mac VLAN and, and IP VLAN, they can enslave the your host NIC and virtualize it at that level. There is open vSwitch. Uh, there are also uh, all sorts of container SDNs that sort of popped up in the last couple of years, including Weave, Project Calico, or Flannel. That's the one that Kelsey mentioned that I worked on. Um, so and each one of those can be used to, uh, to provide virtual networking. So which one is the right one? Uh, there is no sort of right one. There is no best one. They all have their own pluses and minuses, pros and cons. So it's really up to the, uh, I think, an individual deployment to make a choice which one to actually use. And so we have to make, uh, if you're going to make a choice, we have to make a pluggable system for Kubernetes to use so that it can, um, it can uh, provide the operators with control. So another, so now let's think about uh, a little bit more about uh, writing these plugins. So one thing is, uh, uh, is you have to use kind of like a layer two network, I guess. So you have to start out for using Mac VLAN, for example, to provide your uh, virtual layer two networking. But then on top of it, you have to figure out with a strategy to do IP allocation. And there are you know, lots of ways to do that as well. Uh, you can just configure a host with a static range, and then it'll, it can just hand out IPs out of that. Uh, host, and if you give each somehow give each uh, host a non-overlapping block, then they'll be unique. Uh, you can use DHCP, probably one of the oldest technologies for uh, dynamically allocating IPs. Um, there are all sorts of IPAMS systems with an API backed by a SQL database uh, that you can maybe purchase, and you might want to integrate with them. Uh, some SDN solutions also uh, will do IP allocation. For example, Weave. 
uh, can do that for you. So this is another aspect that you have to kind of figure out if you're designing a uh, network uh, plugin system. Okay, what else? One of the things you might want to do is mix and match. So for example, you might want to choose Mac VLAN or IP VLAN, uh, or the user might want to configure to use either Mac IP VLAN or uh, Mac IP, bah, Mac VLAN or IP VLAN um, as the layer two network. But then for the I IP allocation strategy, the user might want to mix and, ma and uh, mix and match and use either DHCP or the host local. That's the one that allocates from a fixed block or maybe some other one. So ideally, we want to be able to compose these things and, and not bundle them together. One of the surprises is that if you're going to have multiple, uh, multiple plugins, the order in which you execute them actually matters a lot. So let's think through uh, an example of, of using a Mac VLAN and DHCP. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create a Mac VLAN device by enslaving uh, your host interface, like ETH0. And once you have the virtual interface, you're going to invoke the DHCP plugin, the IPAM plugin, to use that device to issue the DHCP request, get the DHCP response. Once it has the response, it can go ahead and program the virtual interface with the IP that it has received. But then let's take a look at a different example of using some kind of a routed uh, plugin where everything is done at layer three, and uh, you have to set up some routes. So in that case, what you actually want to do is ask the IPAM to allocate you the IP first. And after you have the IP, then um, the, the routed plugin can uh, make the alterations to the fabric by programming the routes, maybe using BGP propagation, maybe uh, by programming the AWS or Azure SDN or something like that. So the takeaway here is that there is no uh, fixed ordering in which you can invoke these plugins. It's, uh, it's a little bit trickier than that, and we'll see how, how we deal with it. OK, so if you're going to have um, plugins, then we need to have some kind of an interface, uh, a protocol, that uh, is going to be sitting between the container runtime, like Kubernetes or Docker or Rocket, which is a, um, a container runtime made by a company that I work for. And uh, these low-level plugins, the, the network plugins that are sit at the bottom, right? So in between, we need to define an interface. And a container networking interface is a proposal, uh, a specification that CoreOS, along with the community, have put out uh, to try to define what this interface looks like. OK, so what are the um, core tenants of CNI, the container network interface? So every container can join one or more networks. We allow you to join multiple networks because in certain situations, you might want to have a container that uh, joins the database network and some web tier uh, network. Every network is described by JSON config. The JSON config might be stored um, on the host in a form of a file. It might be dynamically generated. Uh, that is outside of spec. Uh, in the easiest uh, implementations, it gets just stored uh, on the on disk, and we'll take a look at the at a sample JSON config in a second. And then the actual plugin is pretty simple. It has to just provide two two commands: add and delete. So the add command gets invoked by the container runtime when it's creating a container, and it's asking the network to join uh, this container onto the network. And the remove is done at the end when the container is getting torn down. OK, so here's the JSON config that I alluded to. Um, for example, you can store it in somewhere in the Etsy directory. And it's pretty simple. So this one says that the, the name is just uh, a name of the network. It can be anything you want. The type, in this case, is bridge. And that is the, the type of the plugin that's going to get invoked. Then there's the IPAM section, for stands for IP Address Management. It's specifying that this network is going to be using host local. That's the mode where um, there's a fixed block, and then CNI is going to be, this plugin is going to be allocating um, IPs out of that fixed block. So in this case, this, this block is 1010 slash 16. So the containers are going to get 1010, 01, 02, and so on. OK. How does it actually work? So let's wor walk through 
kind of from the, from the beginning when the container is being created, being brought up by the networking, uh, by the container runtime. So the first thing that the container runtime is going to do is it's going to create a new network namespace. The, um, here I'm just kind of showing the bash equivalent. Um, and it's going to create a new network namespace, and it's going to use bind mount to give it a named handle in a form of a path. Once it has the new network namespace and a handle to it, it can uh, look into the, uh, into the plugin that's about to invoke into the, the network. So in this case, we're trying to join the MyNet. It opens up that config file, and it sees that the type is bridge. It then locates the bridge in some predefined path. And then the plugin itself is just an executable. So it, it, it executes the, the plugin uh, using environment variables to pass in um, parameters. And then it uses standard in to pipe in the network configuration that it has re read of the disk. So in this case, the parameters that are passing in the command saying that it's add, there's the the handle to the network namespace, uh, unique ID for the container. It's optional, but uh, encouraged. And then the interface name that it's asking this plugin to, once it creates, what, how to name it. So we execute this command, the bridge, and now we're inside the bridge, uh, inside the bridge plugin. So here's a short kind of synopsis of what it does. It's going to create a new bridge. It's going to create a pair of virtual interfaces, the VETs. It's going to plug one, one end of the VETH into the bridge. It's going to uh, move the other end of the, uh, of the VETH into the container network namespace. After all, all of that is done, it's going to move the interface into the up state. It's going to so now we have a interface, kind of layer two networking complete, but we don't have an IP yet. So Bridge knows that the Bridge plugin at this point is going to delegate the IP allocation strategy to the IPAM plugin. Remember that the, net, the config file that was, that's piped into its, that was piped in through its standard in contains an IPAM section which has a type field, and the type field specifies host local. So host local is another executable that it is going to execute. Um, and uh, it, passes, it, it passes the host local uh, plugin, the IPAM plugin, the same set of environment variables that it, has, it was passed in. In practice, it doesn't really need to do anything. It can just fork exec and they get inherited. Uh, the, I don't go into a lot of detail of what the host local plugin is going to do, but the, um, it's going to look into the subnet, uh, subnet range that it was given. And it's uh, using state that it stores on disk it's going to allocate the next available IP, and it's going to return it back to the bridge plugin in a form of a little JSON snippet that you see here. So the, I, the host local plugin decided that this container is going to get 10.10.5.9 slash 16, and it communicates it back to the bridge in the form of this little JSON, right? So now the last step is for the bridge plugin to just take the information that's received in this, um, in this little JSON snippet and then apply it to the interface that has set up previously. And finally, it takes the same thing that, it takes the same JSON snippet that IPAM plugin returned to it and it returns via standard out back to the container runtime. So in this case, the, we have two levels of plugins but really, they compose. The top level plugin decides at what point in time it wants to invoke the IPAM. And that is crucial because it really needs, as, as we've seen in the, from a couple of slides ago, since there is no, right, there is no predetermined uh, right way of when to invoke the plugin, it has to be up to the top level plugin to figure out when it wants to do the IPAM, to do the IP allocation and call the IPAM plugin. All right, so how does it actually work with Kubernetes? So Kubernetes currently has its own uh, network plugins. They were contributed by the OpenShift guys uh, a while back. 
Uh, so this, this ends up being another type of a plugin for Kubernetes. So you get a kind of a plugin and a plugin uh, situation for now. But in the future, if CNI proves out to be adequate, uh, it might become the default and the only way of doing network plugins. But uh, today, the CNI driver uh, is is a Kubernetes network is one of the Kubernetes network plugins. So the way the driver works is that uh, so Kubernetes makes a POS container just to it's an empty container just to create a network namespace, and then uh, once that container is up, Kubernetes uh, invokes the CNI driver, which in turn invokes uh, the CNI plugin. The CNI plugin um, joins the POS container to the network that the user has set up. And then all the other pods, uh, all the other containers in the pods just join the network namespace of the POS container. As I said, Rocket is another container runtime that uh, is now supported by Kubernetes and was built by CoreOS. Uh, Rocket natively supports CNI, so in this case, it's a little bit easier. That Kubernetes can take a hands-off approach and just delegate to Rocket, and Rocket will actually do all of the uh, of all of the work of calling out to the CNI plugins and setting up the network. And that's all I have. Um, if you want to work at CoreOS and on this stuff or any of the other projects that you see at the bottom, um, here's the website. You know, come find me. Um, and uh, I'll direct you to our hiring department. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So we have time for a couple of questions. So we step to the side and take a. Let's go with two questions while you get set up. Yes. Okay, so the question is that all the examples were IPv4. Is there anything about what's what about IPv6? Um, the CNI specification uh, includes specification for IPv6, so you can uh, go on GitHub and see how it's uh, laid out. It's very similar to IPv4. Implementation-wise, it hasn't been done yet. Uh, we haven't implemented IPv4 primarily because we want to flush out the concepts and uh, we haven't implemented IPv6. We want to flush out the concepts in IPv4, and I think it'll be a fairly straightforward to IPv6. Yes? Uh, sorry, what was it? Um, so the question is, do you need to run PGP or something to, to do the routing? That's maybe. That's what the plugin is supposed to provide. If, provi if the plugin wants to use BGP, uh, for to disseminate routes, it's free to do that. And that okay, I think that's all the time I have. Oh, there's no. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, CNI is kind of the plugin in the plugin, and Kubernetes has native networking plugins. Are those different than Docker's new native networking plugins? They are different. Actually, the Kubernetes networking plugins are very similar to CNI. Uh, they also support basically two commands, add and delete. So they map very well to the CNI. Uh, but I think they're a lot more in line with what CNI provides than what uh, CNM or LibNetwork provides. Cool, thank you. <laughs>